From the top secret bunker here in Area 52, this is Pastor Mike, and I'm online, and I'm live, and I'm stirred up. I am fired up, stirred up, uncomfortable. I don't, I don't even know where to begin. Um, I just got off the phone with a man, and if you're listening, um, I'll just tell you that. You want to call and have a nice chit chat about how great Jesus is and about how we're all saved by the grace of God and we're all rotten, hell deserving sinners that uh, deserved hell hot. And Christ reached down his hand and saved us by nothing but his blood and his offering and his sacrifice and his resurrection and our faith. Absolutely nothing else. And you want to call me and talk about that? We'll talk, we'll smile and have a good time and I'll drink my coffee and and everything else. You want to call here and try to put me in bondage or put anybody else in bondage and I find out about it and I'm not going to be nice about it. I will not be nice. Um I I dealt with I've dealt with this so many times. And if I've got one copy of this book booklet called National Sunday Law 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 If I've if I've had one copy I've had 10 of them mailed to me And um I'll tell you I'll tell you the conversation I'm going to deal with uh, Francis the talking pope here in a little bit and uh a man in our church brother George was me and him were talking about it last night and he asked me had I ever read the Jesuit oath and I said oh yeah and if you've not heard of that, I'm going to read it online live today. Uh, in fact, I'll give you something to do. I'll give you some homework to do if you want to just want something to read. Um, Google Books. Um, there's a it's, it's Google's uh, book repository. They sell books. They sell online books. But Google went into um, all of these university libraries, and they had people in there just scanning books. And some of these universities like Yale and Harvard, University of Michigan, even in England and places like that, they just scanned all these old books and, and put them up there. And if you're searching for different things, some of these old books are going to show up. And since the copyright is no longer in effect, I'm talking about books from around the 1900s, even into the 1800s, some as old as the 1700s. And um, I like to look at old books. I like to just kind of see some things they had in mind and so on. Uh, but if you wanted to do a little research on your own, just go to books.google.com and type in Jesuits. All right, and you're gonna f and you're gonna find some books that will be for sale. You're gonna find some books that they will let you browse free while you're looking at a particular subject. But then all of the books that the copyright is no longer valid on them from like the 1800s, they've scanned and they're a PDF, or you can get an EPUB. Uh, if you don't know what that is, that is um, a lot of book readers. Android will read EPUBs. Um, Apple's iOS book thing will read EPUBs. You can incorporate them there and read them that way. Uh, there probably is a way to read them from Windows, one of the apps. I, I think I have one. But anyway, you can get all you can download all these books for free. 
uh, and and many of them were exposing things of the Jesuit order. And I'm going to read you some of those things. Very, very interesting, but some things make sense. Now, here is Francis the Talking Pope speaking, first of all, to the President of the United States yesterday, now before Congress today. And lo and behold, the earth did not blow up. Can you... Yesterday was it was it not the twenty third of September, and the the world didn't blow up, and war didn't break out, and martial law did not kick into effect, and the rapture did not happen, and no tribulation yet. I, I don't know. I'm trying to wrap my head around all this stuff. Anyway, we're going to talk about the Jesuits here in a little bit, but I'm going to deal with this. A guy calls me on the phone, and um, he's patting me on the back and telling me all this. I've watched your sermons all. The, okay, that sounds good, and I'm nice. I'm listening to him. I'm nice. And um, he asked me, he said, I, I, he said, do you know, he asked me, he said, what is the mark of the beast? And I said, um, I'll tell you what, I'll know it when I see it. And he said, so you don't know what the mark of the beast is. And, all, and already now I'm picking up a vibe. Okay. I'm picking up a vibe from this guy. And I'm going, I think I know who this is. I think I know what he's up to. And I want those of you in who live in Kenya, listening on Watchman FM, my journey through Kenya told me one thing, and that is there's a lot of churches in Kenya, and I rejoice in that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. There are a lot of Seventh-day Adventist churches out there, too. They have a very, very big stronghold in Kenya. And if you are of a Seventh-day Adventist church, or you're a pastor of a Seventh-day church, and you're listening to me, either live or rebroadcast, um, I'm going to explain some things to you, and I and I want you to I want you to be receptive to it. Um, not not what I say, but the what the Word of God says, and not what Ellen tells you the Word of God says. What the Word of God says concerning the Sabbath day, concerning law keeping concerning Ellen being a prophetess. I'm going to say some things. I don't want to make you mad, but I may end up making you mad. I made this guy mad. He hung up on me. Um, that's how that's how not nice I am. Um, when, <laughs> he, he's, I'm getting this vibe from him that he, when he starts asking me about the mark of the beast, I've dealt with this before. I've, I've confronted these people or had these people confront me. And um, so he's he's saying, well, he said, Pastor, since you don't know what the mark of the beast is, I said, you don't either. And he said, um, he said, I I have, I have a word from the Lord. I have a I have a word, a message from the Lord Jesus to give to you. And I said, what chapter and verse would that be? He said, excuse me. I said. You saying that you have a a word for me, and I haven't quite totally clued in yet, but I'm getting there. I said, if you have a word from Jesus Christ for me, because that's what you just said, right? He said, yeah. I said, you just said that you had a word from Jesus Christ to me. And I said, if there is, in fact, a word from Jesus Christ through you to me, then all you need to do is tell me what book, what chapter, and what verses to read, and I'll read it, and I will accept it. He said, well, he said, it's, um, he said, it's, it's, it's a, I, I can't really explain it and get into it uh, on the phone. I'm going to need about eight to ten hours from you. And I just went... Mm. You're wanting eight to ten hours from me to do what? He said, to, to give you this word from the Lord. I said, unless you're prepared to sit down in front of me and read to me from the King James Bible for eight to ten hours, I could just tell you to save your time. I'll read it on my own. You just tell me where to go, and I'll start reading it. He said, well, you don't, you don't know where the, the mark of the beast is. And he started in on this stuff. He said, I just can't really explain it in 8 to 10 hours. I said, then it must not be very simple. It must be really complicated. And he starts talking to this. And I cut him off and I said, sir, let me ask you this question. Does, does this mark of the beast thing that you keep talking about have anything to do with going to church on Sunday? I nailed it. 
And he said, well, yeah, he said that Sunday worship is an abomination and it's, it's against, there's, there's no law in it. And I said, stop right here. I said, here's what I'm going to ask you. If you can show me from the, from the King James Bible, from the word of God, from the scriptures, not what Ellen said, because I don't care what Ellen said. By the way, I'm going to give you some things Ellen said, Ellen White here in a little bit. I'm going to give you some things that she said. I have a document uh, that was given to me by a friend of our ministry. Who This guy used to be Seventh-day Adventist, and he was hardcore in it. And all of a sudden, God pulled him out. And now as he's going, what in the world was, <laughs> what, what am I doing in these clothes? What was I thinking? <laughs> what is my name? Anyway, God pulled him out, and uh, he's like, that's bondage, Mike. Pastor, he said, I appreciate anything you say on the seventh day. He said, I'm for you. He said, they're nothing but pure bondage, and it's works salvation. He sent me a document um, probably a year ago, two years ago, something like that, and I've used it on Pastor Mike Online, and it outlined, it. he just gave me some things that Ellen said in her many books, The Great Controversy and others. And I'm just going, no way. This this all happened quickly today, like 11.20 this morning, and I've been searching feverishly. I've searched on two different computers. I've searched my cloud accounts. I've searched my Evernote. I cannot find that document. He said he's going to send it to me later on. But anyway, I'll tell you what she said. But he's, he's, he's going on about how Sunday worship is, is wrong. It was added by the Pope, and... Um, and, and and on and on and on and I and I finally said, look, let me tell you something. I said, if you can produce for me one verse, I'll need two as a witness. But if you can produce for me one verse from the Word of God, not not from Ellen, not from your own interpretation, but if you can include, give me one verse from the Bible that says and commands that I must worship God or go to church on one day only and forbids me from worshiping God any other day of the week, then I will apologize to you and I will gladly submit to it because let God be true and every man a liar. And he said, he said, but you've got it. He said, I can't just give it to you like this. He said, it's going to require eight to 10 hours. And I know what that is. Listen, I know what that is. That is some guy, and he said he had some DVDs he wanted to send me. And he said, these men, he said, these men will teach you this. And I said, look, pal, I said, these men are liars, and I won't listen to them. They're liars like you are, and they're liars like I am. And I said, let God be true and every man a liar. And so if, you're not, if, if you can't give me scriptures, don't send me to these men that's going to try to trip my head around and twist scriptures around and make me think that I'm that I'm truly saved if I keep the Sabbath and go to... No, no, let me say it like this. If I go to church on Saturday, because going to... Here's, here's going to church on Saturday is not Sabbath keeping. It's not. You're not going to find... You are not going to find a verse in the Bible that commands us to go to church or go to the assembly or publicly worship God only on Saturday and forbids us from doing it on the first day of the week, the third day of the week, second day of the week, the fifth day of week at 12.45 p.m., you're not going to find that in the scriptures. And I told the guy, I said, let me tell you something. When I get judged by God, he's going to judge me according to his laws not yours, and not Ellen's. And he said, well, he said, okay, it, it, over here in, uh, in, um, in, um, in, in, uh, in Exodus, yeah, it's Exodus, uh, Exodus 20. And I'm going, yep, been there, done that. Let's read Exodus 20, can we? Exodus, I am, I'm, these, these people, they make me squint. I just go, what? Exodus 20. Here's the Ten Commandments, people. Here's the law of God. Now, do I believe 
that the law of God is still good? Absolutely. Do I believe that if I break these laws, I'm in condemnation? Absolutely. And I told the guy, see, I'm not nice about this. Because these people seek to put you under their bondage by telling you you're not saved like they are if you don't keep the Sabbath, which in their interpretation means go to church. If you go to church on Sunday, they say you have the, or you will receive the mark of the beast. That's what they say it is. And um, I just, I'm not nice about it. And I said, let me tell you something, bud. I said, you're standing there boasting to me about how good you are because you go to church on Saturday and you say you keep the fourth commandment. I guarantee you, you lust after other women. You commit adultery with them in your heart. You're a liar. Guarantee you, you're a liar. You're a murderer. You hate people. So while you brag about keeping the Sabbath, you break other laws that are in there. And I said, I know what Ellen said. And and here's one of the statements that Ellen White made. I will be get, I don't have the document now. I will be getting the evidence later. But Ellen White claims now that she had a vision. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. See, it's not in your Bible anywhere. It's not here. It comes from Ellen. And Ellen says that she had a vision and she was taken up into heaven and she saw the Ten Commandments. No, not, not the movie with Charlton Heston. The, the real, like the Ten Commandments in heaven. And she said that they were all written in this glorified lettering. And they were all bright and shiny and, and everything like that. But she said, but the fourth commandment was shining brighter than all of the rest of them. The glory of the fourth commandment outshone all of the others. And I went, uh, <laughs> that's not in the Bible. Then she said this, because Paul, let me pull the verse up. So you know exactly where I'm going here. Uh, there we go. Uh, let's see here. It's, it's Colossians chapter 2. Everybody turn there. Turn there, Colossians chapter 2, and be quick about it. Colossians chapter 2, let's, let's draw a circle around this. Let's go, oh, here we go. Let's go to 8. Let's go. Need to work on that, but anyway, let's go in our Bibles. Hope you're there uh, to Colossians chapter two. And let's go to verse eight. You heard me say that like twenty times in a row. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Underline that part in your Bible. After here we go. The tradition of men. After the you know you know what the guy told me. He said, well, absolutely is the law of God because the Bible says that it was Jesus' tradition to go to synagogue on Sabbath day. And I went, mm. see, that's tradition. There we go. It's tradition. That's what they did. And sure enough, it's what they did. But there is no law commanding me to go to a synagogue or a church on Saturday. Zero. It doesn't exist. So he says, uh, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, 
which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. He's referring to law-keeping. Law-keeping required hands to circumcise. We are circumcised by a circumcision done without the hands of men. That means that no prophetess, no pope, no religious figure saves us or declares us to be saved. It is God and God alone who does these things. Uh, you're complete in him, so on and so on. By um, He said, not the circumcision made with hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye also ye are risen with him through the faith of of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your, tre- in your sins uh, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross." And Ellen, here's what Ellen says about that. She's well aware of what Colossians says. So in this vision that she says she had, she sees then that Christ blotted out the handwriting of ordinances, which is the Ten Commandments, with the exception of the Fourth Commandment, which is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. How convenient is that? That she establishes a doctrine, finds no place in the Bible whatsoever to back her up. All of a sudden now, an angelic bus comes by, and she gets on it, and she gets bussed up to heaven. And not only not only does she see the fourth commandment blazing in glory above all the other commandments, she was told now, she was told this, that Christ died for all of the Ten Commandments except the fourth one, and you've got to keep the fourth commandment in order to go to heaven. How convenient is that? You don't find it anywhere in the Bible, and yet you take a little trip to heaven, and they tell you that up there, and you come back down and say, I have another gospel for everybody, which is exact. And I told the guy, I said, you're going to try to give me Ellen White's nonsense, and I said, she's burning in hell right now. Oh, pastor, you surely don't. You can't say that. Oh, yes, I can. Paul said it in Galatians chapter 3. If anybody, though we or an angel from heaven bring you any other gospel, let him be accursed. And I don't see anywhere where Ellen on her deathbed said, Hey, everybody, I lied. I didn't really see that. We're saved by grace through faith. Jesus, I'm sorry. She never said that. Let's read the law. Which, by the way, concerning me and my offenses, I got a really good lawyer. I sure do. He is my advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Here is the fourth commandment. This is Exodus 20, verse 8. Get your King James Version Bible out. You can look it up on the Pure Bible Search software for Windows, Linux, or Mac, or go to, I forgot it. Um, she said she's going to put a link up to it. Some of you are already saying, man, this is cool, because now we, we, we got a web version of the Bible software to work on tablets and phones, all right? And I've used it a little bit, and I like it. Anyway, Exodus, or you can just open up an old Bible, you know, one that's printed on paper. Uh, verse eight: Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, how do we keep it? How do we keep it holy? Well, it tells you right there in the verse. Remember it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Then, then, God and God alone is going to tell you how you should have it in remembrance. How it should be a memorial. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, 
nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And I read that, and he read it to me, quoted, I guess he quoted it or read it. But he read it to me, and I said, amen, I believe that. Absolutely, I believe that. And I said, show me where it says in that verse or those verses that I am commanded to worship on one day only and forbidden to worship on the first day of the week, the second day of the week, the third day of the week. I said, show me where it says that in there. He said, well, it doesn't. I said, that's the first thing you've said right so far. It doesn't say it in there. And I'm already under condemnation because I have broken the law and so have you. And therefore, we need an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who has kept the law for us because we can't do it. And um, we talked a little bit. I overtalked him. He overtalked me. And finally, he, he, and I quoted, I get this. We're going to go there in a little bit. I quoted Ephesians 2. And when I got done, he said, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I said, no, you don't. No, you don't. I said, that was the word of God there. You don't rebuke the word of God. If you do, that's not good. Let me help you with something, okay? Um, let's, let's just pretend. Let's just pretend that the fourth commandment said, uh, thank you, Donna. Appreciate it. Webchannel.purebiblesearch.com. Very good. Wait a minute. I have, I can do, there we go. There we go, right there. I had it already. Let's pretend that the law required you getting up, hooking up your mule or your donkey or your horse or your ox, and riding your cart to a central location where all the other people were supposed to gather. And you were to sit there and have a service and then leave. And the law required that strictly, and it was not to be violated. My goodness, my goodness. They caught a man back in, back in the days after God gave the law. They caught a man picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. <gasps> oh, the scandal. It was a skit. You know what they did? They brought him before Moses. He was executed. God was not kidding. He was executed for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. That's how God sees obedience to the law. Some would say, oh, my goodness, he was just picking up sticks for a fire. Did you know that God made a provision to, for that to be done the day before? So anyway, let's just pretend now that the law does actually say you're supposed to get on your donkey and ride to church and go to church every Saturday. And if you don't, there is a severe punishment for you. Okay, let's let's just pretend that. Let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 22. Let's see what Jesus said about the law. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. In fact, in verse 36, they come to him. They're trying to get him in a trap. Master, which is the great commandment in the law. Now, surely, surely, had Ellen White actually seen that the fourth commandment had greater glory than the rest of the commandments, and the fourth commandment was not one of those that Jesus died and took away from us, surely then Jesus would have borne witness to that when they asked him what the greatest commandment was. Because they said, Master, what is, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus never said, oh, that's easy. That's the fourth commandment. Go to church on Saturday. He never said that, did he? Here's what he said. Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened to it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now look at verse 40. On these two hang all the law 
and the prophets. And if you were to just, if you were to go back to Exodus 20 and look at it, Deuteronomy 5 is another copy of it. If you were to go back to Exodus 20 and take a look at that, and you can clearly see the first four or five commandments. Five is sort of transitional because you have two mothers and two fathers. Okay, you have your earthly father and your heavenly father. But the first set of the commandments apply directly to God and our love and our obedience to God. The second is our love for our neighbor, because if we love our neighbor, we won't be in bed with his wife. We won't even be looking at her through the Venetian blinds. We won't do that. If we love our neighbor, we won't kill our neighbor. If we love our neighbor, we will not lie against our neighbor. If we love our neighbor, we will not steal our neighbor's stuff. And so he's just from a, a, a verbal analysis of it, yes, there are two distinct parts to the Ten Commandments. But also look at it like this. Moses illustrated this very thing. Because when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the law of God, he doesn't have it on a USB drive. He doesn't have it written on a scroll anywhere. He didn't write it on his hand so he wouldn't forget it. He comes down and it's written on stone. Not just one, but on two. It's a, for, it's a foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to declare to everybody that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the second one, here's the other table, the second one is love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Isn't it neat? In the typology of Moses, why did he come down with two tablets? To, it's a foreshadowing of Jesus giving us these two laws, these two commandments that you and I are under right now. I'll give you another one. I, I love this. Okay, here is who was it? The Moabites, or the Ammonites, or the Tikbites, or the Mosquito Bites? One of the one of those that was fighting Israel. And Moses went up on top of a mountain, and he held he had the rod of God in his hand, and he held his hands up. And while his hands were up, the Israelites prevailed. But see how many fingers am I holding up here when I hold my hands up? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank God it's not twelve. Amen. But he's got his hands up. He's, he's holding up the law. Moses. Moses is. the Anytime you see Moses, you're seeing the law. Here's Moses holding them up. But you try this. You try this at home. Okay? Make sure nobody's around you because you look silly. All right? Hold your hands up and keep them there. After about, oh, five, ten minutes, you can't hold them up any longer. You know why? Your flesh is weak. It's a great lesson in that, people. The law pertained to our flesh. And while you and I seek to uphold the law, the weakness of our flesh won't allow us to. And watch this. Subsequently now, when Moses lowers his hands to rest, the mosquito bites or whoever it is, prevails now over Israel. So Moses pulled his hands up again. Now Israel's winning, drops his hands. Now the other guys are winning. So here comes, who was it, Aaron? Was it Joshua maybe or somebody? They come up there and Aaron takes one hand and the other guy takes the other hand and holds them up for him. Now look at this. Now his 10 fingers on his hands are being held up. They're hanging on these two guys. <laughs> I love that. And they held, the, they held them up there all day long. And Israel won that war. You see, do, you see the, do you see the beauty of that? Do you see the typology of that? And I wasn't necessarily trying to be mean to this guy, but I wanted to illustrate a point. My goodness, people, we pat ourselves on the back because we did one thing right out of the law. And then we go look at some guy and, or some gal and we say, wow, boy, she's nice looking. We broke the law. Now we're under condemnation again. Ezekiel 33. Let's turn there. I mentioned this the other day. You could have read it. You probably should have. Some of you did. Ezekiel 33 gives us what happens 
when good people turn bad. Ezekiel 33. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, let's see here. The righteous committed. Oh, look here. Yeah, verse 13. Here it is right here, people. Get this. Ready? Ezekiel 33, 13. When I shall say, you know, that's interesting. Because the Masonic Lodge in Washington, D.C. has that exact same number pattern on it. It has 33 columns on the Greek temple. And then above it is a 13-step pyramid. 33, 13. And masonry is all about their works getting them to heaven. Verse 13 of Ezekiel 33, when I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousnesses shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Did you catch that? If you are trusting your own righteousness, which is every Seventh-day Adventist, every Hebrew rootist, every sacred namist, and every other ist that demands Sabbath corporate worship, if you are going to trust to your own righteousness, the very moment that you sin some other sin, that Sabbath observance is dead, and it's gone. It's wiped away. That's what that says right there. You cannot, and you will, and God will not let you. Listen to me, people. God will not let you out-glorify his son. He will not let you do it. Now, turn to... Um, Turn to John chapter 15. I'm going to clarify this because some would say, oh, well, yeah, it's, see, we still got to keep the law. Let me show you this. John 15. Jesus characterizes the two and establishes that um, these, um, these two hang all the law and prophets. Now, John chapter 15. And I want you to understand the, the beauty of the, the, the typology of Moses and then Christ. Moses, and Paul talks about this. He talks about it in uh, 2 Corinthians, I think it's 3. 2 Corinthians 3, he's talking about Moses coming down and the glory. And the law had glory, but Christ, the mediator of a new covenant, has more glory than the Old Testament law. I mean, there, there is a foreshadowing here. Moses is a predecessor and a foreshadowing of a greater light than even he was. And, and I've said this before. Uh, the Hebrew Roots people and the Seventh-day people would have you believing that Jesus came to give testimony to Moses. And it's the exact opposite. Moses comes to show testimony and to show forth the glory of Jesus Christ. That's why when, Je when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, he's face shining as the sun. Now, in Matthew 17, Moses is sitting in the background... Moses is the law. Elijah is the prophets. These two give testimony to Jesus whose face is transfigured and shining as the sun, brighter than even that of Moses. And so the truth of it is, Jesus did not come to draw us back to Moses. Moses came to show us the way to Christ. Amen? Because not even, listen to me, not even the lawgiver of Moses, not even Moses himself, qualified under God's terms. He was cut down and not allowed to enter the promised land. And yet Jesus came and lived his entire life yet without sin. So in John chapter 15, here's what Jesus here's what my savior told me. Jesus said, "If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love." Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Did you catch that? Jesus is not telling us that keeping Moses' commandments is necessary. Jesus said, I already kept them. Those were my Father's commandments, and I kept them. 
So as I have kept my Father's commandments, the ten, so you keep my commandments, the two. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the two that we're under right now. Um, Take your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Here's, here's where the Bible really straightens all of us out on this issue. Romans chapter 2. <clears throat> this man called judging me because he said, you're not to work on the Sabbath day. You're to, you're to, he said, you're supposed to work on the first day of the week. I said, yeah. Yeah. He said, that's what it says. You're supposed to work the other six days. And I said, have you ever seen me on Sunday? What? I said, have you ever, you ever, you ever seen me? Ever watch me on Sunday? No, I can't say if I have. I said, then how dare you judge me? I said, I get up Sunday morning and I work my tail off. Sunday school, Sunday morning. During the day, between Sunday morning and Sunday night, I'm laboring in the Word, and then Sunday night I'm giving the Word. I said, I work my tail off all day Sunday. And you could have heard a pin drop. And I said, don't ask me or don't demand to me that I have to do that exact same thing on the Sabbath day because if I did, I would then be breaking the very law that God told me not to break. I would be laboring and working on the Sabbath day. And I said, I work six days a week, usually sun up past sundown. And I'm telling you, when Saturday comes around, I take a break. I rest. And I don't say that boastfully either. I'm just telling you, I think keeping the Sabbath day the way God said to keep it is a good idea. I think it's right for us to have a break Take a day. In fact, Jesus told us why the Sabbath day was there. He said the Sabbath day was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It was made for your benefit. Work six days. Work your tail off six days. But you're going to need that day of rest to get away from it. And normally, it's exactly what I do. So anyway, here's, here's what he said in Romans 2. And, and, I, and I mentioned this. I said, so while you keep, while you say that you keep the Sabbath, then you're looking at another woman and you're lusting after her. So that makes you right back where you started from, a sinner. Paul said this, therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same thing things. You're going to judge me from the law, right? It's the law that judges you. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest that thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? That's what he thinks. He th- and listen to me. We're going to go to um, we're going to go to Ephesians here in a little bit. Because Paul said, not of works, lest that any man should boast. And I'm telling you, in all my years of experience, I'm telling you that every group, every church, every faction, every denomination, and every cult that requires a work performance in order to receive blessings from God, every one of them boast themselves against everybody else. That's what they do. I don't care if it's the Seventh-day Adventists who boast against everybody else that they are the one true church. By the way, in the 1800s in America, you can, you can look at this historically. In, the, in America in the 1800s, there was an explosion of cult leaders and and men with names like William Miller and Joe Smith and Ellen White and um, uh, Charles Taze Russell, there was an explosion of men and women who were telling people that the true church had been corrupted. 
It had been corrupted by the leaders of the denomination. It had been corrupted by this, been corrupted by that. And all of these guys now, they would come up with all these weird doctrines, and then they would say, we believe this. This makes us the remnant of the true church. We are the real true church, and everybody else has got it wrong. And that's not what, that's not what Paul said. Paul said the foundation of the church standeth firm. Jim Staley said the same thing, said in his vision, Jesus showed him the house of God and it was all busted up and the foundation was all crumpled and everything like that. And I'm just going, uh, mm-hmm. no, no, that's not what the Bible says. And so anyway, they always boast against those. If the seven day people, they boast against the people who go to church on Sunday. They say, look at us. We are the only ones who are doing the work of God and keeping the commandments. Therefore, we are better than everybody else. Or or it's like in, um, in King James only fundamentalism, where the ladies never wear pants and the men have very, very short haircuts. And we all have a King James Bible. And, and nobody has a TV, nobody listens to radio, nobody does this and nobody does that. And I, listen, I'm not against any of those things. I am not against any of those things. But here's what I've heard most of my life, is that the people who do things will almost always boast against people who don't. Whether it's Sabbath keeping or haircut keeping or radio station keeping, or tithing, or anything else, they almost always boast themselves against the people who don't do what they do. I used to be one of them. I used to have a very judgmental, arrogant attitude toward anybody who did not have my God-given standards. And one day God broke me, showed me how wretched I really was while I was judging everybody else, how filthy I was, how arrogant I was. And God just reminds me every now and then, Mike, do you see how you're thinking now against somebody? Yeah. Remember who you are? Yeah. You don't think that way anymore? No. Lord, I can't. So, Lord, what I don't like about somebody, you you forgive them like you forgive me. Um, he says, um, let's see here. Verse 11 of Romans 2, For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Um, mm 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 um, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Um, look at verse 21. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that teach, preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit sacrilege or adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? Boy, Paul nailed it. He nailed it. And this guy called me to boast about his keeping of the law against his observance or his thinking that I didn't keep the law. And I told him, I'm saying, I'm going to be real honest with you. I don't. I don't keep the law. Neither do you. And I think this prob- this phone call was probably the result of me putting out a Bible study yesterday called the the message of the three angels because the Seventh Day Adventists are big on these three angel discs. If you've not seen that Bible study, go go take a listen to it because uh, in Seventh Day Adventist theology, the three angels 
are there to show everybody that they have to keep the fourth commandment, and if they don't keep the fourth commandment, then they're going to burn in hell, even though the angels never say anything about that. That is how they interpret it. Uh, Take your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. A lot of this stuff you probably already know. It's good to go back over it every now and then because these people are slick, and I don't I get really wound up at people coming to other people demanding that they keep some little thing out of the Bible and putting them in their bondage, saying, if you don't do this, then you're not going to go to heaven like I am because I do and you don't. I don't do. I guarantee I don't do. I don't do anything. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? It's witchcraft, it's what it is. That you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only what I learned of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministered to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. It is of faith and that alone. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Now here's something that he said. Um, He quoted James where it says, uh, uh, faith without works is dead, faith without works is dead. Let me help you with that, okay? Ephesians chapter 2, let's start there. Ephesians 2. Let's look at verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of what? Yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, anybody with a brain, and I'm I'm going to switch targets here for a minute. Anybody with a brain who reads Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 would know that belief, faith, and trust is not a work. It's not. And there are people out there making YouTube videos running their big mouths out there. Well, if you believe in repentance, you're preaching a false gospel. You're work salvation. If you believe you have to believe, then you're preaching a false... Because they say that's works. Believing is work. Come on. For by grace are you saved through faith. Listen to me. Faith is always required in salvation. Period. Faith is. Faith is your part of the contract between God and mankind. God's part has already been accomplished. The law has, the requirements of the law has already been satisfied. Jesus not only kept the law, but then he took our law breaking on himself and paid the price and atoned for it so that you and I who have not kept the law are now clean and stand as if we have always kept the law. We stand free and clear before God Almighty, who does not see our sin because it has been, just like that teaching on the white blood cells, it's been covered, chewed up, and swallowed, and it doesn't exist anymore. Man, I love that. That's God's part. Our, Our part is belief, faith. Do you trust what God said? Will you continue? And I believe salvation is a continuance of that faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. Now he's clarifying it, what it means by not of yourselves. He's clarifying it. He does not, you cannot isolate the phrase, that not of yourselves, and then go tell everybody, you had nothing to do with it. You never have anything to do with it. That is, that is not true. These people will isolate a little piece out of the out of the circle and try to get you to believe that you had absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. It wasn't even your choice. And you're just saved because God said so. Faith, people, not of works, 
is part of the clause of not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I'll say it again. Any religion, any denomination, church, ministry, or any just lone ranger knucklehead on YouTube who does some sort of performance will always boast against those who don't. Those of you who have come out of um, tongues talking churches, you know what I, you know what you know what I mean, don't you? Okay, you come out of tongues talking churches, and um, because you were in the church. And everybody went down front, and they were talking in tongues, and you weren't. And they looked at you like you had Jezebel written all over you, like you had leprosy or something. And they always boast against you because they are the exalted ones who God gifted with speaking in tongues, and God must love them more than he loves pitiful you because you don't speak in tongues. Whatever they do, I guarantee you, they boast. They brag. They brag against everybody else who doesn't. And I'm going to tell you something. I am always going to be on the side of those who can't rather than those that do. That's who I'm going to be. I'm, I'm, I'm your friend, and I'm telling you, I'll never turn my back on you. Because at least you're honest about who you are. And honesty is what brings salvation. Honesty before God. God, I am wretched. I am awful. God, if you save me, don't expect very much out of me, which, by the way, he doesn't. God, doesn't. God doesn't save somebody in hopes that they will, at some point, it'll kick in and they'll start keeping all the commandments. Doesn't happen that way. If you're one of those that tried... And can't. I mean, and I mean, you tried again, and you tried again, and you tried again, and you tried again, and you can't. I'm on your side. Okay, I've I've hung around people all my all my religious life. I tried to be in with the people that I admired and looked up to, who I thought did no wrong. And as time went by, I grew up, became a man, and not only realized, but saw it with my own eyes that some of these very men that I admired were not who I thought they were, though they boasted that they were. And that, God used that in my life to show me, Mike, I didn't call you to preach because I thought you were going to be perfect, and boy, was I wrong. My gifts and my callings are without repentance. I called you to preach because I know you, and I know what you've done, and I know what you're capable of, and I know that you don't think that you're better than anybody. Amen. So I, I'm being honest. You want to call or you want to write me a letter and you want to tell me how what you do and how you're better than everybody else and how you're better than me and I'm just I've got no time with that crowd okay I don't have any I'm just not going to spend the guy wanted 8 to 10 hours of my time <laughs> and I'm just going my wife don't even hardly get that except for on sweetie pie day which is tomorrow by the way now let me let me finish let me finish the little discourse that Paul started here for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And if anybody do any works after salvation. No, it doesn't say that. Here, here's what it says in verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Do you see that? Created in Christ Jesus unto what? 
good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Did you know that sitting here in this room in front of this microphone with this camera and all this weird stuff on the wall, did you know that that wasn't my idea? It wasn't. God just kind of put that in my head one day. I don't know. What time is it? I am. I'm going to tell the story. If you come to our top, top secret broadcasting bunker and and I'm going to show you around. I'm going to bring you in this room. And I'm going to tell you the story of this room. And when I tell you, see, this is going to fit in with, I'm on the side of those who can't. Because I knew a guy. He was my brother-in-law. My wife's brother. Who, since he was about a teenager... He always told me, Mike, I'm the black sheep of the family and I know it. He started from a, from a young person. As soon as he got a car to drive in, he was out there, buddy. He fell into liquor, fell into marijuana, fell into more beds than we want to talk about. And um, that's who he was. By the time I met him, um, right before Lisa and I got married... Um, I went to work with him and my father-in-law working for uh, Brother Ron Dagonia, who's preached here a few times and will again. We all used to work for him. He ran a drywall and painting and installation business, and that's where I, a 21-year-old punk kid, that's where I went to work. And God took this young man who thought he was better than everybody and made me work right alongside a drunk and a dope fiend and a whoremonger and everything else and we became friends we became good work partners because we got to where we could pull up to a house we used to do a lot of interior painting on houses new construction that was our that was our thing and he and i would just get out of the truck he didn't have to tell me what to do i didn't have to ask him what to do we went in we did the house we got out we did a pretty good job and we left and we became a good team and all the time that he and i worked together he started having some influence on me and that was part of what god was getting my attention with at one point in my life but i also had an influence on him and every now and then he'd ask me about god and i'd tell him some things there was a couple times when god laid it on my heart to talk to him one time about things in his life and he was gonna he was gonna hit me he told me he told me the next day he said i was gonna hit you i was gonna tear your head off i'm going oh my goodness god why did you do that well, he and I parted because I came into this ministry. I came into the Bethel as the pastor full time, and he was still working out and drywall and everything. Like had his own had his own company, was making money. Well, he was wasting all of his money on liquor and dope and women and everything in the world. And he married a woman, then he they divorced. He married another one, they would divorce. He married another one, they would divorce. Then he finally got tired of marrying them. Then he just go around and playing music and bars and everything like that. And for a while there, he hated my guts. And he hated my guts. He was very, very angry at me because I was because I was living for the Lord, and he knew it. And um, he married. He finally married his seventh wife. And he moved down to a town just south of here called Bon Terre, Missouri. Okay, it's a French town. So he moves down there, and we see him at family get-togethers every now and then. And one, one day, he came to a family get-together, and he is as white as a piece of paper. And he's carrying his oxygen bottle around. He's in his 50s. He smoked all of his life. And now he's walking around with this oxygen bottle, and he is as pale as a ghost. And he told us, he's I got I got breathing problems. I think I got COPD or emphysema or something like that. And I, at, at, let, let me back up. At one point, things were so bad with him, he ended up in jail. And while he was in jail, and he kept trying to make phone calls, get people to bail him out, and nobody would bail him out. So he had to sit in there and eat rotten bologna sandwiches. And while he was in the county jail, he finally got down on his knees and said, God, I'm, I'm tired of this. I can't live this anymore. God, will you save me? And there was a song that was that was soon to be coming out. He got an advanced copy of it through somebody he knew. It was, I found Jesus on the jailhouse floor. And that was his song. And when he got out of jail, I started working with him. 
visiting with him, talking to him, baptized him, trying to encourage him to keep coming to church. I could tell, though, he had so much baggage from his life that it, it wasn't letting go easily. And at some point, he just kind of withdrew, and I just kind of withdrew. And I thought, I don't know if he's saved or not. And so when I saw him there with just white as a ghost, I, I prayed. I said, God, will you please, before he dies, let me go sit by him and talk to him so that he knows where he's going and I know where he's going because I'll probably end up preaching his funeral and I don't want to lie. And I prayed that one time. About, I don't know, 10 months, something like that, somewhere around in there, maybe a year, his seventh wife kicked him out. Now, he's, he's not working. He's on disability. He's sick. He has nothing to his name other than a disability check he gets every month. He's got this old truck and a few tools he's collected and some guitars. He's a really good guitar player. And he moves back up to um, a, a little trailer there. And out of the blue, he starts coming to church. Didn't even have to say, hey, Steve, won't you come to church? He just started coming to church. And he would sit by his mom and dad in church, in our church. And I'd sit, I'd be preaching away, and I'd sit there seeing, I'd see him going, amen. Amen. And I watched him for weeks, and I went, he's different. He's, he get, he's got it. And he come out of the church one Sunday morning, and he asked me, he said, Mike, or Hoggard, that's what he called me, Hoggard, Hogman, uh, if you need anything done around here, he said, I'd like, to, I'd like to do something around here. He said, I'd like to do something for the Lord. And I said, sure, Stevie, I will. If, if, if something comes up, I'll give you a call. He said, okay. And about two weeks later, I woke up one morning, and this room was in my mind. I mean, boom, I woke up and I went, yeah. So I got up and I came to the church and I called him. I said, Steve, I got a project for you. And I come over, and he come up here and I, I showed him what I wanted. Showed him that I said, build these two walls here, paint these walls green. And uh, I said, build me a little plywood desk here. And I said, I'm going to put some foam pads on there. And he said, what are you going to do with it? I said, I don't have a clue what I'm going to do with it. Maybe like a little recording studio or something like that. He said, well, that'd be cool. So he went to work on it, put the lumber up, put all the drywall up and taped it and everything like that and built me this little this little desk here. I've had it replaced since then, but he put it in here and I started putting foam pads in here. And there it was. And then the idea came to start doing a Pastor Mike Online live streaming broadcast Tuesdays and Thursdays. Back then it was for one hour. Though he being dead yet speaketh. Not too long after that, he comes in on a Sunday morning. He says, Mike, I need to talk to you before church starts. I said, what's, what's on your mind, Stevie? He said, I want to know for sure that I'm going to heaven. He said, I don't want to go to hell when I die. I said, Stevie, I said, I've, I've watched you. And I said, I can see a difference in you. And I said, I don't tell people this just because. I said, but you're going. I see it all over you. And we prayed in my office that Sunday morning. And Friday morning that week, he was dead in his bed. His son met us there at the little trailer he lived in. He said, Dad was different. He said, I'd just walk in here. Dad be sitting there reading his Bible. Tell me about the Lord. Tell me he wanted me to go to heaven. And I'm just going, that ain't, that ain't Steve. That is not Steve. See, we're not saved by works. But we are saved unto good works. And the room that you're seeing me in right now God took the meanest and when I say meanest at one point he shot a guy the guy was bleeding all over his house he had to get him out of there I think the guy lived but nobody was calling the cops on this little deal I guarantee you 
God took the meanest, raunchiest, whoremongeringest, drunkenest, dope fiendest, lying, cheating, two-time double-dealing, mean mistreating human being. And he saved him, and he did one thing. Built this room. He being dead, yet speaketh. That's how God saves us. Not all this nonsense about, well, you don't go to church on Saturday, or you don't do this, and you don't do that, and you don't have this doctrinal statement. It's not about that. Grace through faith unto works. You put the works before the grace through faith, you don't get it. But when God saves you, he moves in you and does through you what he wants done. And that is exactly how this came about right here. Um, let's go to James now. Let's go to James, all right? Hebrews, James. Um, about this faith without works is dead thing, okay? Now, some people don't like James, so they say, oh, James for Israel, that's not for the Christian, that's not for us. James chapter 2, let's look at it. He said, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. That's exactly, that's Ezekiel 33. It's exactly what it said. So you keep the Sabbath, right? Or in your, your version of it, you keep the Sabbath. And yet, you're wanting to be in bed with your neighbor's wife. Or you've got an Ashley Madison account. Or you're a drunkard, privately. Nobody ever sees you. you. I guarantee you, you've got an issue a mile long that you're using going to church on Saturday as your spiritual uh, fig leaf apron. Whosoever should keep the law, whole law, yet offend in one point, his guilty of all. By the way, the Apostle Paul made it clear when you when you bring in any part of the law into your salvation equation, if you bring in one command it, commandment, you have to bring in all of them. Because just keeping one is not good enough. So if you choose to live by the law and under the law, doesn't matter if it's just one law, you will be under then the condemnation of the law if you offend any part of it whatsoever. So then he says, verse 11, For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Same mouth. Came out of God's mouth, didn't it? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. What if it profit my brethren? Though a man say he have faith, and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warned and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith without works, or faith if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yeah, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. And really, here's what he's, here's what he's telling you. You will do what you believe in. There are no atheists who come to my church and say amen and put money in the offering plate here at Bethel Church. They don't do it. There are no Roman Catholics who come to our church who say amen to me preaching against idol worship. That doesn't exist. If you believe that you can worship statues and go to heaven, that's what you do. If you, if you don't believe in God and you believe the church is a scar on the face of humanity and you hate Christians, you don't go to their church and join as members and amen the sermons and give money to them. So likewise, if you say 
that you believe in God and his son, Jesus Christ, and the atonement of sin for salvation, if you say you believe those things, and yet you never indicate it with any of your actions, then you're lying through your teeth. You don't really believe what you say you believe. That's the point of James chapter 2. It's not that now works is added to faith faith and if you don't do these works well then obviously you don't have any faith it's not that at all it's just that if you really have the faith that brings salvation there will be a manifestation and evidence in your life that you are who you say you are that's how simple that is i got uh went went a, went a little ways on that one that guy got me stirred up The Jesuit Oath. Francis, the talking pope, is there in uh, Washington, D.C. He spoke, made kind, liberal remarks to the president yesterday. Uh, I haven't read too much on what he said before Congress today, but I'm reasonably sure it was veiled references to gay marriage and um, socialism and um, let's be liberal like I am, and, um, uh, and I'm a communist and a socialist, and I think every American should be as well. I, I kind of just guess that's who he is, because he is a liberal, and he's got conservatives in the Catholic Church that hate his guts, okay? But I, I'm, I'm, I think he is the Pope for this time. I think the Catholic Church realized that it needed a politically correct pope. I think they realized they needed a pope who was open and accepting because the goal of the Catholic Church and the goal of the Jesuit order is to divide, conquer, and assimilate anybody or any group or any nation or any country or any denomination that will not be ruled by the Vatican. That is what the Jesuit order is all about. And Pope Francis is the first Jesuit Pope. The Jesuits are a very dangerous organization started by Francis. Was it Francis? Yeah. No, Ignatius. I was going to say Ignoramus de Loyola. Started by Ignoramus de Loyola as the militant arm of the Vatican, the enforcers, the guys named Guido who carry, who carry machine guns. That's, that's the Jesuits. Jesuits over the years have infiltrated universities, seminaries, political think tanks, nations. Once Jesuits are in a nation, they embed themselves and they infiltrate and they try to take over. They try to influence. They try to bring nations under the vat. I'll give you, I'll tell you a little interesting story. Um, back in the late 60s, early 70s, somewhere around in there, there were two Jesuit universities in Baghdad, Iraq. Two of them which means that you had a Jesuit stronghold in Iraq. There was a young militant general at the time that hated the Jesuits, saw the power that they had, hated them, and during his rise to power, he had both of those universities shut down and their Jesuit leaders expelled out of Iraq. That young, up-and-coming, zealot general was named Saddam Hussein. Jesuits have a motto that goes like this. The Jesuits never forget. So here is Saddam Hussein who puts out the Jesuits out of Iraq. Where is Saddam Hussein now? Last time I saw him, he was hanging, swinging in the wind. Okay? So guess what? Now the Jesuits are back. Okay? See how it works? We have a Jesuit pope. 
If you've read the any of the Alberto series, um, then you these are things that you probably are aware of. There was a man by the name of Alberto Rivera. He was a Spaniard. His mother put him into um, a Catholic seminary as a young boy so that he would grow up to be a Catholic priest. That's what that's what Mama wanted for her bambino. And Alberta, Alberto, Alberta is a girl. Alberto Rivera talked about his life in this Catholic seminary in, um, in Spain. And at one point, there was a boy that wanted to crawl in bed with Alberto, who was also a boy. And Alberto punched him in the nose and said, get out of my bed. And Alberto was brought before the headmaster of the seminary, who, who was a Catholic priest, who told him, Alberto, this boy was trying to show you Jesus' love. How dare you hit him and treat him that bad? And I'm going, okay, I get it. I get it. I know what's going on here. See, you got all these boys in this Catholic priest seminary, these guys who are not allowed to marry but still have urges. So these guys, these priests, are now just channeling their urges to anything that's around them. And that's why you have so much Catholic priest abuse going on all over the world. The Catholic Church stinks with it. But anyway, Alberto grows up, and he chooses to become a Jesuit priest. And he finds out he's being, he's being lectured and trained on infiltration. The Jesuit order will have people who will infiltrate into areas of Protestant Christianity or Islam or other religions pretending to be one of them in order to bring about subtle changes in Protestant groups so that at some point they stop resisting fellowship with the Vatican and start embracing fellowship with the Vatican. You have to ask yourself this question. Whether or not you believe Alberto's testimony, you have to ask yourself the question, are we now in the 2015s, are we now in a situation where Protestant churches are now embracing Rome, whereas before they rebuked Rome and called them called Rome the, the whore of Babylon and called the priest or the Pope the Antichrist? Long time ago, that's what preachers called it. The Pope was the Antichrist. They wanted nothing to do with him. Now, the Vatican has infiltrated. It has filled Bible colleges and seminaries. It has Its agents has written books to make people believe things that are contrary to the Word of God and to get them to, to embrace Rome. To embrace Rome similar to the way that Oh, I don't know. Rick Warren embraces Rome. Some say he's a Jesuit plant. I say he doesn't have to be. He may have just been trained well. But that's what the Jesuits do. That's what their order does. And so it doesn't surprise me that we have a Jesuit priest who appears as a globalist, as someone who is hip to the modern scene. After all, this Pope tweets like teenagers do. He uses the media. He uses social networking. He uses all of these things that are current with our lifestyle and all culture in order to bring them into a response of, this man is a holy man. We will follow. I'm not a Catholic, but I'll follow him wherever he goes. He has that effect. That's been evident. That was evident in Cuba, and that's been evident in the United States of America. This guy's a rock star coming to America, and they're falling over him like they did the Beatles. So there is, there's several copies of this online. And this is, this was published by um, Chick Publications. There, there are other places, other sources you can get it. It's the Jesuit Oath of induction. If you want to become a Jesuit priest, 
Here's what you have to swear to. Here is the your when when you stand ready to receive the blessing of the Jesuit order, here's what your superior will tell you. My son, heretofore you have been taught to act the dissembler. You know what that means? An assembler brings things together. A dissembler tears them apart. Among Roman Catholics, you're to be a Roman Catholic and to be a spy even among your own brethren, to believe no man, to trust no man. Among the Reformers, to be a Reformer. Among the Huguenots, to be a Huguenot. Among the Calvinists, to be a Calvinist. Among the other Protestants, generally to be a Protestant, and obtaining their confidence to seek even to preach from their pulpits and to denounce with all the vehemence in your nature our holy religion and the Pope, and even to descend so low as to become a Jew among Jews, that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. You know what they're telling them, don't you? You're a spy. We want you to go to a Baptist church, pretend to be a Baptist, even if they ask you to teach or preach, get up and say the Catholic Church is the whore to gain their confidence and all the while you're there to very subtly subvert the teaching of the Bible and you're to bring them into bondage by the things that you know about them. You've been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities, provinces, states that were at peace and incite them to deeds of blood. I don't know if you know this or not. But there was Catholic influence in the Civil War of the United States of America in 1860. And you can say, well, that's old conspiracy theory. However, Jefferson Davis himself, the president of the Confederate States of America, dispatched a letter to the Pope asking him for help to win the war. Historical fact. Uh, let's see here. Where else? Where else? Let me read the oath. Here's what the Jesuit swears to. Here's what Francis, the talking pope, as a Jesuit priest, swore to. I, state your name, my name's Francis, the talking pope. Now in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed Michael the Archangel, the Blessed St. John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles, St. Peter, Paul, and Mary, the answer is my friend is blowing in the wind, and all the saints and sacred hosts of heaven, and to you, my ghostly father, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, founded by St. Ignoramus Loyola, and the pont pontificate of Paul the Third and continued to the present, do by the womb of the Virgin, the Matrix of God, and the rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ, Vice Regent, and is the true and only head of the Catholic or Universal Church throughout the earth, and that by virtue of the keys of binding and loosing, given to His Holiness by my Savior Jesus Christ, He hath power to depose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, all being illegal without his sacred confirmation and that they may safely be destroyed. Now you have to ask yourself the question, does the Vatican love the Constitution of the United States? No, not at all. Do you know why? Because the Constitution of the United States does not demand that all citizens in the United States of America be Catholic. Doesn't demand that. Whereas, if you go to Dave Bradley, our friend Dave Bradley goes to Italy every year. He goes to Rome, Italy, usually around Easter time, so he can hand out gospel tracts to all the millions of people that have assembled at the Vatican to hear Il Papa say some sort of thing in Latin that they don't understand. And he is forbidden by Roman law, by Italian law. He's forbidden from handing out certain gospel tracts. Why? Because they're protecting the Pope and his religion in Italy. 
There are other nations in the world where the official religion is Roman Catholicism. Maybe not so much by law, but by making sure that no other religion in that state gains any ground whatsoever. This is all the doing of the Jesuit order. Um, Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I shall and will defend this doctrine of his holiness, right, and custom. And see, here he is. He's standing before our Congress. It just, it just doesn't sound right to me that a man who swore an oath that says any nation that does not have the blessing of the Holy See of the Vatican is not a legitimate nation. And there he is standing before our Congress. Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I shall and will defend this doctrine of his holiness, right and custom against all usurpers of the heretical or Protestant authority, whatever, especially the Lutheran of Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and then and the now pretended authority and churches of England and Scotland and branches of the same now established in Ireland and on the continent of America and elsewhere and all adherents in regard that they may be usurped and heretical opposing the sacred mother church of Rome. I do now renounce and disown any allegiance as to any heretical king prince or state named Protestant or liberals or obedience to any of the laws, magistrates or officers. I do further declare that the doctrine of the churches of England and Scotland, of the Calvinists and Huguenots and others of the name Protestants or liberals to be damnable and they themselves damned who will not forsake the same. According to Francis, the talking Pope, you are a damned. Baptist, and you believe in a damned Bible, and I'm not using that illicitly. That's their wording. Do you think the Vatican was all for King James of England putting together a translation of the Bible that was to be a pure word of God? Oh, yeah. They were fiercely opposed to it. They tried, the Vatican tried to have the King James Bible never published. That didn't work. In fact, not only was it published, but it pretty much birthed a nation, the United States of America. So, let's see, let's think about this for a minute. You have a nation whose God is the Lord. You have a nation where there is a King James Bible in just about every house in America. And they have the liberty of the gospel. And you can't control them. What do you do? You dispatch agents spies, infiltrators, usurpers. You send them to rise up amongst the churches to gain advantage over them by way of leadership, by way of seminary training, by way of publishing companies. And slowly but surely, You start changing over the mind frame of the American Christian from the King James Bible to other translations because at the beginning now, listen to me, at the beginning, all of these other translations were comparing themselves to the King James and they were saying, it's just like the King James, only easier to read. That's what they were doing. Now you've got a situation where Some of you know this. Name the churches in a 50-mile radius from where you live right now that preach the King James Bible only. Some of you have written me and said, "We've, we've tried just about every church we could. We can't find one. It's worked, hasn't it? Pretty good. 
I mean, they're still publishing the King James. It's just that nobody's buying it anymore. Nobody's reading it. Nobody's promoting it. So now what have we got? We've got a 17-year-old boy going in the girl's bathroom, and everybody says thinks that's a wonderful idea. Um, somebody wrote me today and said that they think that Lila, Noah, the 17-year-old boy in the girl's dressing room, is uh, probably pushing. He's probably got an agent right now. He's probably pushing to have his own reality show. Okay, eh, that might be. Um, here's what else it says. Let's see here. I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own or any mental reservation whatsoever, even as a corpse or cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ. Um, I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity present, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to do, and to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics rip up the stomachs of their women and crush their infants heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable race that when the same cannot be done i will secretly use the poison cup the strangulating cord the steel of the poniard or the leaden bullet regardless of the honor rank dignity or authority of the person or persons whatever made their condition in life either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus. Because after all, Jesus wants me to kill people. That's what he wants me to do. Uh, understand something. The Jesuits are the one organization in the Vatican, that while they, while they promote the Pope and while they the promote papal authority, they themselves are not under it. The Jesuits are, they have their own Pope. He's called the Black Pope. No, 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 it's not Jesse Jackson, okay? It's the Jesuit general the head of the Society of Jesus. He's referred to as the Black Pope. And the Jesuit will even kill his own Pope if he finds out that Pope has gone against the direction or the authority of the Vatican or the Black Pope, the Jesuit general. Consider the death, if you will, of... Albino Luciani, who was Pope John Paul I, who, when he became Pope, was made aware of certain wrongdoings by members of the Vatican Councils, or whatever it was, the Secretary of State of the Vatican, Cardinal Villo, a Frenchman, was involved in some pretty shady banking goings-on with the Italian Mafia and was a member of the P2, which is a Freemasonic organization in Italy. And after all, the Vatican says that it opposes Freemasonry. And yet, the Vatican itself is infiltrated with numerous men who are Freemasons or P2 Freemasons. And Pope John Paul I found it out. And he was going to clean house, as it were. So 32 days after he becomes Pope, he writes up a document of all the people that he's going to fire the next day, and Cardinal Villo was on that list. And the next day, he was going to make that list known of all the prelates and cardinals and officials within the Vatican that he knew to be corrupt. He was going to have them put out of office. 
And then the Lord called the dear saint home. That night, in his sleep, he died 33 days after becoming Pope. You see, the Jesuits, they bow to no man except the Jesuit general. So what does this tell you? What, what do I, what do I think is going on here? I think we have a Jesuit Pope who bows to a man behind the scenes, the Jesuit general. And whatever the Jesuit general tells him to do, that's what he does. We have an agent in our country standing before our president, standing before our Congress, getting the blessing of the American people. We have an agent of Mystery Babylon herself riding around in his Pope mobile, acting like he is all high and mighty and he is everybody's friend. You see, I think that when the beast and the false prophet finally show up, I don't think people's going to have a hard time following either one of them. I think the spirit of that is already at work and it's being manifested in our time right in front of our very eyes. Interesting things going on. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Let me um, let me see if I can read a couple of emails here. Got about 20 minutes left to go. And if you've got any comment or anything that I have spoken about today, if, if you happen to find the verse in the Bible that says I have to go to church on Saturday, you can send it to me. The email address is... We do this, Pastor Mike online at gmail.com. Let me look at a couple of emails here. Um, this is from Aaron, who says, Hi, Pastor, I posted a saying on my Facebook page that said, quote, The most important decision you can make in your life is accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. I agree. I agree, everybody. All of God's people said. And I had a guy say, Jesus is not waiting to be accepted. God does not wait on man. I didn't say anything back, just left it alone. But I was like, what? That's not right. I just know not to believe what he said. Let God be true and every man a liar. I also think of this verse, Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. If you don't accept Jesus, you are denying him. I've accepted Jesus. He is my Savior. He is my everything. Aaron, I appreciate you sending that in. Uh, let's see here. Let me see if I can... Hey. Michael writes in and says, I have faith in works, the complete and perfect works of Jesus Christ. I like it. It's pretty good. Uh, Rose wants to know, uh, hi, Pastor Mike, why do churches, why do churches teach and demand tithing? And then I guess they're answering so that God will bless you. Isn't tithing a work like this Sabbath keeping? Thanks, Rose. Now here's Rose. Let me I just, I don't know where you're coming from in this. So let me just say this. God himself said in Malachi, he said, prove me now herewith, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and be a blessing to you. Okay, I'm paraphrasing it, did a lousy job, but it is in regards to tithing. Now, there are some who say that nobody should tithe anything in, uh, in our time right now, and if any preacher takes a collection or says anything about tithing, he is a false prophet, he's going to burn in hell, and that money should go to poor people. Okay, uh, There is actually a lot better teaching in the Bible than that. Um, you do not hear me, Pastor Mike, either in this program, watching my broadcast, Sunday school, Sunday sermon, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You don't hear me every other week saying, give, 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 tithe, tithe, tithe. Many of you have written me and told me that you were part of a church and it was just like, well, I wonder how he's going to preach on tithing today. Because for some reason, that's all he knows how to talk about is tithing, 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 tithing. 
There are some churches, I admit, Rose, that there are some churches that inject their authority into people's bank accounts, and there are churches who have sent people a bill for tithes that they have not yet collected yet. There are churches who require you as part of your membership to um, send in your tax return, the one that you send to the IRS, so the church knows how much money you make, and then they will check that against how much money you gave. And if the two, if what you gave is not a tenth of what you make, according to the IRS, then they send you a bill for the rest of it and say, if you're going to be a member of this church, you better pay your part. That's wrong. That is, I don't care. That is wrong, wrong, wrong. But if you go to that church, you're under that authority. That's what you got to do. You don't have to be under that authority. Now, in the Old Testament, the tithe was for one purpose. The tithe was to be brought in and given to the Levite priests. Why? Because God would not allow the Levites to own any land. Therefore, they could not farm. They could not ranch. They could not raise goats. They could not uh, harvest barley or wheat or corn. They were not allowed to have an inheritance of land. Therefore, they could not seek out their own wealth and their own benefit. They were devoted directly to the house of the Lord. But how are they going to eat? How are they going to feed? The, they, they have to have a family, have a wife and children. How are they going to feed them? How are they going to end up paying taxes? How, are, how is the Levite priest going to be able to survive in the same world that the, those from Judah and Ephraim and Manasseh and Gad and Dan and those other tribes, they can go out and make whatever money they want to. If we have a good year and they bring in good crops, I mean, these guys have got it made. And what about the Levite priests? What do they have to stand and beg every day? God, God would not allow them to have another occupation. And so the tithe was brought in, and God actually specified what part of the goat could be theirs, what, what part of the grain could be theirs, and so on. And they were to receive a tenth of what was brought in, and it was for, and get this now, watch this, okay? I, I don't like money preachers, but that doesn't mean that God's servant cannot be blessed when everybody else is, because... God didn't give them a set salary. He gave them a portion, a tenth. So if the rest of the nation of Israel, if they had a tremendous year in crops and in cattle, guess who was the beneficiary of 10% of that? The Levite priest. If the other tribes had a good year, the priest had a good year too. That's how it worked. Okay. So now the Apostle Paul is teaching us about the benefit of those who labor in the word of God. Paul, as an apostle, refused. He refused taking money from anybody. He would set up and he would, he would God gave him an occupation where he could earn income. He was a tent maker. And if people bought a lot of tents, he got a lot of money out of it. If they didn't buy much tents, he didn't get very much money. But that's where he chose to get his income from. But it was his choice to do it that way. I know a preacher who has a pretty good sized church. I'd say probably two, 300 people in there. They could support him very well. I think he just barely takes some little token of a salary from them. I don't even know what they pay him, if anything. Because outside of that church, he has other things that he has inherited that he and his family does. And he lives quite well off of that. So he's not one of these, I'm going to take all the money guys. But the Apostle Paul used this illustration. Thou shall not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. What does he mean? And he said, does God careth only for oxen? And he's did that in the context of teaching the church. 
that they should supply and bring in for the needs of those who labor in the word. I do not, I do not have the both either the opportunity, the obligation, or even the time to work another job outside of what I'm doing here. I preach and teach eight times a week. That involves quite a bit of study and preparation time. If I was if I was having to work the manager's job at Taco Bell, or if I was on the night shift at one of the local manufacturing plants, there'd be no way in the world I could get by eight sermons a week. Wouldn't happen. I don't have the obligation by this church. The church, this church takes very good care of me and my family. And I don't have a complaint. Haven't I have never complained in all the years I've been here. This church has taken very good care of me. I used to feel just as guilty as everybody else did until I realized, Mike, this is not just your occupation. This is your calling. And so I have learned that I don't have to get up and make a big deal about how much money the church needs or how much, how everybody has to tithe and everybody has to do this and you have to do that. I've learned over the years that if God's in it, he takes pretty good care of his people. And that's, that's what's going on here. I would that all churches would treat tithing and giving in that same way. And for those of you, for those of you who say there is no New Testament commandment to tithe, you're right. But if we are looking for an example to give to the work of the Lord, God has given us an example in the Old Testament. And it's an easy example. Do the math very quickly. All right, here you go. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, let's say you earn a paycheck, and I'm going to give you the amount of the paycheck, and you tell me what 10% of it is. All right, here we go. Ready? $860. $86. Okay, here's another one. $442. Oh, I, that's easy. $44.20. See how easy that is? God made it easy. And so if you're looking for an example on how to give, God already gave you one in the Old Testament. All right? So, yes, there are churches who do it wrong. They demand, they demand, they demand. They, they make it sound spiritual. But the truth of it is, I've learned this in this ministry. That when God's people love God's people and they love God's man, they'll just give. And they give pretty well. And I'm thankful for what God has placed in our hands here. Okay, So why do some churches teach and demand tithing? Uh, Rose, I'd say probably because they're pretty money hungry. Okay, And that's all they care about. There are some churches, however, that preach it and teach it because they know that's God's best. That is God's way. And it just works that way. I'll give you, I'll give you one example, and then I'll go on to something else. At a young age, Lisa and I, after we first got married, we, we had it pretty rough, like many new married couples. Okay, um, We were married in July of 87, and right before Christmas of that year, Lisa comes to me with a little bow on her belly. She's going to have a baby. Okay, Nine months later in September, there's our first child. But Lindsay encountered some problems about halfway into the pregnancy and she couldn't work. She was working at an oral surgeon's office. She couldn't work no more. It was up to me. I was making $7 an hour and that was the only income we had. And then right after Lindsay was born, a few months later, here comes Alicia. Okay. And there it's interesting. They're both Alicia and Lindsay are both born. September 15th is Lindsay. September 13th is, is Alicia a year later. That's like the Duggars, okay? But anyway, during that time, I'm working construction. That's either feast or famine. And for a while, it was famine. Lisa came to me one day. She hadn't been working. I was working, making about $7, 7 an hour. And she said, we have enough money 
to pay our tithes or to pay the electric bill. And I looked at her and I said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So I said, Sweetie, pay the tithe, and I'll let God pay the electric bill. And he did. Okay? I didn't give that money to God with the expectation of return. See, I love God. I'm sitting here in this chair now not doing this and I've run this through my mind several times Mike if you got kicked out of this place and you had to earn your living some other way would you still do this the answer is yes I don't do this because I'm getting paid well I do this because I love what my God has done for me and I'm his servant and I'll do it whether I get paid or not I've done it before so when your heart is right with God Tithing or not tithing is really not a question. You just give. You give because you know you want to give and you love the Lord. And that's why you do it. Oh, let's see. Who else is here? Uh, Let's see here. Uh, Pastor Mike, it's generally said Muhammad's angel was confirmed to be of God by his wife's Khadijah's Catholic, some say Jesuit cousin. I don't know. I've I've not read that. All right, that's you'd have to. I'd have to see that. I wouldn't mind seeing it. All right. Um. <laughs> uh, Barry, Barry writes in says, uh, "Worship on Saturday." He said that's in the first book of Bologna, chapter one, verse one. There, the the must go to church on Saturday. Do I get a free video? Yes, you'll get a free DVD from us. Okay, it'll be blank, but it'll be it'll be free. And and let me say this: um, there is a verse, Romans chapter fourteen, verse six, talks about those who regard a day. And let me just say this: if you feel led to worship the Lord on the Sabbath day, there is no condemnation against it I would not condemn you I know some people who on Saturday that's where they spend the majority of their time in prayer Bible reading they're keeping that day holy but why are they doing that they're doing it as unto the Lord but then there are others who worship the Lord on other days and Romans 14 covers that so if it is in your conscience to, to, to segregate yourself for a day, to, to serve the Lord, to study, to pray, to meditate, to worship him, it's an honorable thing. But it is not a commandment that that's what we must be doing on this particular day. The command, commandment given was simply to rest all right. Uh, let's see here. Suzanne, hi, Pastor Mike. What are your thoughts on the European immigration crisis? Part of me says, love thy neighbor as thyself. The other part says, if I was the Muslim leadership, And I had a mandate from Allah to take over the world for Islam. I would probably do and cause to go into effect what's happening right now. Spreading Islam by force all over the world. Let me give you an example. The book of Acts when Jesus said, you shall be witnesses unto me in Judea and Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. While the church was in Jerusalem, they were growing and they were doing well. But nobody was going to Judea. Nobody was going to Samaria. So you know what God did? God allowed persecution to go into Jerusalem. And all of those people scattered. 
And when they did, they went everywhere preaching the word of God. Now they're in Judea. You know how God got them into Samaria? He persecuted them in Judea and they went to Samaria. And I see a parallel here. This is what's happening. Is Islam, I do not think Islam is supposed to take over the world. I think Islam is supposed to go and fracture the world so that more evil people behind it can take over the world. And I think that's what's happening right now. In the St. Louis area, they're already talking about how many thousands of Muslim immigrants they're going to try to get into the St. Louis area. That's my back door, people. I, I cannot begin to tell you. Maybe I'll talk about it sometime when I was in Megory. And I knew the power of that witchcraft that was associated with those mosques. And I determined within myself, Mike, I, you do not want to live in the area where there's a mosque. And I, I think it could happen. It's going to be with you today. Uh, if you did not agree with everything I said, at least you might have been provoked to study the Word of God for yourself. That's all I wanted you to do to begin with. I don't know why you're wasting time listening to me. Get your Bible out and go study it. Watchman broadcast coming out Sunday. It's part two of the Groves. Uh, there's already going to be a part three, I can tell you that. And uh, be come and be with us Sunday morning as we worship the Lord.